Welcome back to Next Gen Console Watch, our show following everything happening with the next gen slash current gen consoles, PS5, Xbox Series X and X. I'm Damon Hatfield. Joining me this week from IGN's PlayStation Podcast, Podcast Beyond, is Jada Griffin. Hello, hello. Hello there. And from IGN's Xbox Podcast, Podcast Unlocked, Ryan McCaffrey. Howdy, Damon. And we're about to talk about five games that we believe fulfill deliver on the promise of next gen. If you remember back in 2020, which was approximately 37 years ago, uh, leading up to the release of these consoles, everyone was talking about how loading times would be a thing of the past. We're gonna be playing our, playing our games in 4K resolution, 60 frames per second, um, and every game is gonna be using ray tracing for more uh, realistic lighting and reflections and shadows and all that. So we think that uh, while that hasn't been the case for every game released for these consoles, we think there are at least these five that really sort of epitomize that promise of what next-gen gaming would be. And I think we should start with the game that's out today, that the, this episode is live, this, the Friday of this week, Spider-Man 2 from Insomniac. Uh, a, a game, an incredible game, in my opinion. Uh, I love it. It's like, it's so impressive. Everyone's talking about the fast travel and the loading and how quick it is. It's, it's barely more than a second to completely load uh, a, you know, a whole area of the map and switch between the two characters. So, Jada, start, let, let's start here. The, is this the, uh, the, the main sort of most impressive next-gen feature of Spider-Man 2, you think, the loading? Yeah, the, yeah the, the fast travel is spectacular. I, it's, I dare to say it's the ultimate level of fast traveling that we've ever gotten in a game. I think it's arguably it is now the goalpost for fast travel in a game. I think it's yeah. the best system ever made. I think that the only way that it's going to get better is developers are going to need to learn from what Insomniac did, steal a few tricks from their toolbox, and then try mm. to implement them in their own ways. Um, the, sp the fast travel in Spider-Man 2 is like it's near instantaneous. It's a couple seconds. And the fact that it is pinpoint accurate to the map, uh, with the exception of like trying to fast travel directly onto uh, story objectives or side missions, where it puts you, I don't know, 100 feet away, which takes you all yeah. of half a second to swing or web wing <laughs> to, um, is just, it's miraculous. I cannot, I, I was so floored by this uh, experience. Yeah, even, I mean, just even loading into the game from when you boot up your PS5, you load up a Spider-Man 2, even just loading into the game doesn't take more than a couple of seconds, I don't think. We're also gonna, you're also gonna see much more dense auto and foot traffic in the game than we did with Spider-Man 1. Every mode used in the game uses ray tracing. There's no option to disable it. I just this this game could not have run on the PlayStation 4. Ryan, have you gotten to spend any time with Spider-Man 2 yet? I've not had the pleasure. I've been busy reviewing Super Mario Brothers Wonder, uh, a game and a console right. we're not talking about today. Although it is out today, also <laughs> for mm -hmm. those that yeah. are interested. But yeah, I'm glad, Damon, that you brought up the the population density. I'm sure you saw mm -hmm. the same thing I did going around social media this week of the side-by-side -side of Spider-Man 1 remastered on PS5 and Spider-Man 2 of, of about the same spot in the city and just the, the first game, even on PS5, having not a ton of cars, not a ton of mm -hmm. pedestrians running around, and then just a full-blown, like, just dense New York City traffic, both, both auto and pedestrian, going on in Spider-Man 2. Uh, now that I'm done with Super Mario Bros. Wonder, this is the next game I can't wait to dive hmm. into. Uh, Miles Morales is probably maybe my favorite PS5 game so far. It's between that and hmm. another game we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, yeah. But yeah, Spider-Man 2, just, just can't wait to dive in. It's so good. feels like a real true blue PlayStation 5 game. No other PlayStation could have pulled this game off. And you mentioned uh, that other game. That other game happens to be also from Insomniac. I hope the audience will forgive us from picking two Insomniac games here, but they really feel like the MVP of developing for these current-gen consoles, what they've already delivered, Miles Morales, Spider-Man Remastered, Ratchet and Clank Ripped Apart, which is this game, and now Spider-Man 2. So when Ratchet and Clank, uh, they first experimented with, you know, loading up different worlds instantaneously. That was like sort of the whole gameplay hook of that game. And I think they've even improved that for Spider-Man 2. There's a sequence, without spoilers, there's a sequence that sort of plays with what they were doing with uh, Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart. So, Ryan, also you had said at the time uh, that you thought Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart was the best looking console game you had ever seen. You think that's still true? Uh, it is for me. I mean, it's with, mm. a, with respect to all the other great games we're talking about on, on the show today and, and plenty of other stuff that's come out. I know it won't be true forever, but sure. that game, I mean, it's still, it's just stunning in, in every yeah. way to look at. I mean, the, I mean, certainly the art direction helps. It's just such a vibrant, colorful game. 
but the detail in everything from the characters to the environments i mean it's just it is a magnificently gorgeous game uh, and it even makes some of the best use of the dual shot excuse me the dual sense that i've seen yeah. so far as well uh, there's one part where you walk you go into a nightclub and the kind of thump of the bass in the nightclub is kind of reverberating through the speaker of uh, and the and the you know haptic feedback of your dual sense so just top to bottom ratchet and clank rift apart i feel like it it's I don't know if I would say it's overlooked, but I would say it's probably underrated. I'd say it's probably point. like underappreciated, maybe, yeah. like because it's definitely rated well, like it's reviewed right. well. And Insomniac yeah. deserves all the flowers that we're sending them with this episode, and they just they deserve all the praise and attention that they get for how much how great they do with these games and how much work they put into these games. Damon, you said earlier about how Spider-Man 2 loads basically pretty much in a few seconds. Ratchet mm -hmm. Rift Apart did this as well. I think we timed it. It was like eight seconds, maybe six seconds from the time you boot up the game and hit start to like loading yeah. into that first cutscene. I mean, you know, the, the famous, a famous quote that I'm going to butcher now from the PlayStation 2 before that, the PS2 came out. It was supposed to be, I forget what executive at Sony said it, but it was supposed to be like playable Pixar movies. Mm. Well, it took a few extra generations, yeah. but... Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart is exactly that. I mean, that is, yeah. if, if that were just, if you weren't controlling, if you were just watching B-roll of it, cut together cinematically, you'd think, oh yeah, that's, that's the new, that could be the new Pixar movie. It is, it is an incredible game from a, from a technical side of things. And uh, the gameplay is there too. It's a, it's a nine and a 10 video game, uh, if not higher as well on, on top of it, because mm -hmm. Insomniac has a long history of making games that both look and play great but yeah technically speaking visually speaking it's it's absolutely stunning and, and probably still the best game i've i've ever seen in my life so far another recent one uh that we think we should be added to this list is cyberpunk phantom liberty along with cyberpunk 2077 2.0 the 2.0 patches here and with that patch they left the last last gen systems behind so going forward the current state of cyberpunk it is only just a current gen game and I think everyone seems to agree, it's, it's finally the fully realized prom the game that was promised before launch, and the, the, the game that people were expecting to get, is what you get now when you play Cyberpunk. Not possible on uh, the last gen systems. And just one of the things I've noticed is, as I've been sort of dabbling with um, Phantom Liberty and the 2.0 patch is much better smoke and lighting, so much so that uh, smoke will reflect the neon lights that are around it. You might see like pink or blue neon lights reflecting off of smoke clouds, which is very, very cool. Jed, I know you were spending a little bit of time with uh, Cyberpunk 2.0 just last night, is that right? Yeah, you know, I wanted to dive back in and have a fresh take on this conversation since I knew we were gonna be talking about it. Um, and, you know, I haven't played, I put, I think, 90 hours into Cyberpunk when it first launched. Yeah. Um, and then, or like 50 hours then, and then another 40 hours once the PS5 version launched. I put in like a, like four or five hours last night, and it was just kind of surreal how much better it looked and how like just better it felt to play and run around in this world. Um, I haven't started the Phantom Liberty DLC yet, but you know, watching some of the cutscenes, I was not convinced that the Idris Elba cutscenes weren't live action videos. Like yeah. I, I, I was like. That's just that's just Idris Elba. That's that's he's just in a room with a camera. And no, that's I mean it's just remarkable how well they got his likeness into the game. Ryan, you played Cyberpunk uh, on PC at launch, though, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I really want to dive back in. This is just the this, this couldn't have come out at a worse time. I mean, not that it's not worthy of of my time. It certainly is. <laughs> but between Mario and Spider-Man, Starfield, I still want to play a lot more Starfield, even though I've spent a good bit of time with it so far. It's, uh, but yeah, I, it, you know, when you think about it, if you take away, just kind of zoom out, take away all the drama of the rough launch of Cyberpunk and, mm -hmm. and uh, all that stuff, and you kind of zoom out and you see Cyberpunks, they started on that game about 10 years ago now. Mm -hmm. Because remember, it was announced mm -hmm. forever ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they've been slowly building on it ever since. And so, it is kind of what we're playing now with Phantom Liberty is, is kind of the culmination of a decade of work by an incredibly talented team, which it just shows you like how hard it is to make an a incredible AAA game, even when you have a lot of talent and a lot of resources. 
And I know we, we do our best not to take these great games for granted, but I think that's just kind of a, a nice little reminder that, that man, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to do this and we have to savor and appreciate it when it's here. And so, yeah, I really do want to get back uh, into Cyberpunk with Phantom Liberty and, and pick up where I left off. I was probably, I don't know, 10, 12 hours in uh, in V's story. And, and I, I'm sure it's probably going to blow me away visually if picking up on my PC version. <laughs> or, or if I started over on the Series X, I'm sure it would still very much visually yeah. impress me based on everything that uh, CD Projekt Red has done with this 2.0 update. Yeah, and I think it's fair to have the criticisms about, you know, it's rough launch and stuff like that. Um, and then also the fact that um, we really wanted something and we got a different thing and what we were expecting. But, you know, I agree. I agree. It definitely sometimes you've got to like kind of step back and just like, wow, this is this is actually is a marvel of a thing to look at. We mentioned two PlayStation exclusives before. And I think there are two Xbox exclusives that should, that are worthy of mentioning here. Ryan, Forza Motorsport uh, just released... Uh, I guess a couple weeks ago now. 4K, 60 frames per second with ray tracing, much more realistic foliage, trees that you drive past, much more realistic lighting in car interiors. I don't know, best looking racing game all time? What do you think? I think it definitely is has got the belt for now. Um, mm. Racing games typically don't hang on to that championship belt for too long because there's always another killer racing game, whether it's from the, the, Microsoft's own studio over at Playground it, with the inevitable next Forza Horizon game, uh, which, because those two teams, Playground and Turn 10, have a shared tech pipeline. So whatever improvements one makes to the engine, the other benefits from, and then the other one builds some new cool stuff into the engine, and then the other one gets to use it. A good example is weather, like Playground built weather, and now everybody, uh, all Forza teams, both of them, can use weather so uh yeah i mean it is motorsport is kind of delivers on what you were talking about at the top damon about that 4k 60 promise with ray tracing mm -hmm. with all you know with quick loading times like forza motorsports probably the the epitome of that on the xbox side so far and it is just a ridiculously good looking car game uh i I've really enjoyed playing in the first-person cockpit view in Forza games basically ever since they added it. And there's no reason to, to not do that in this one because you just, like you said, the, the, the detail in the interiors of, the, of all these awesome cars is just too cool to, to pass up the perspective on. So, yeah, kudos to Turn 10. Uh, this is a game that is now meant to be a platform and be built on for a while. So... There's seemingly not going to be a Forza Motorsport 2, but I guess we'll get more tracks, more cars, game mm -hmm. modes, and things down the road. But uh, they've, they've set down a heck of a baseline here for the next four or five years of Forza Motorsport. Don't forget, we can also turn the wheel full 360 degrees inside the car now. Like, you get the full 360-degree rotation. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't really gotten to spend some time with Forza. There's so many games this year. Like, it's just been yeah. uh, just a jam-packed year. Um, I did get a little bit of time earlier this year with, like, Gran Turismo 7 and in VR. And so I'm really excited to see how that kind of pairs with the, when I get, uh, get some time to play Forza on my Series X, how that kind of compares, like, in that cockpit mode and stuff. Um, I imagine they're both going to look great. But, man, I just, I'm excited to see that. Yeah. Two really good-looking racing games this year. The last game we wanted to mention is Microsoft Flight Simulator. Now, obviously, you know, you can fly over the entirety of planet Earth with realistic weather conditions. But Ryan, I think myself and maybe some others could use a refresher on just what, what technology is happening here with, their, with the streaming underneath the hood. Yeah, I mean, this is, if, if for a little bit of a deep cut here, uh, Crackdown 3 was originally mm -hmm. supposed to have this cloud-powered destruction where you would, you would, you know, you're basically a superhero going around the game world. You could knock down buildings and punch ho holes in walls and things. Right. And that would be, that would utilize not just the local power of your Xbox One console, but the, the power of a whole ton of Xbox Ones in the cloud. And it would, it would utilize that processing uh, power that never quite really came to be. Well, Flight Simulator, obviously in a very different application is the realization of that. I mean, it is using all the, the horsepower, the 10.2 teraflops, of the Series X itself, but then there's a whole bunch of Series X blades in the cloud, the Azure system that Microsoft has that they license out to Sony and others as well. 
uh, for their use. That's how good the system is. That you can, as you said, you can fly anywhere in the world and you have accurate geometry on the ground, uh, complete with all the real-time weather effects. I mean, it really is, it is a, a technical marvel. I know it's maybe not the first game that anybody that clicked into this episode thought about, but you know, it's a simulator, not a game per se, uh, but it is nonetheless just an absolute brilliant technical achievement that, that epitomizes what this generation of consoles is capable of. I mean, it's an mm -hmm. experience you can't really get anywhere else, even to this, you know, it's what, three years old now at this point? Right. And I don't think there's anything that's come out that's gotten close to what we get to experience when we're in the cockpit of playing a uh, flight simulator. Well, I think what's really exciting is that um, even though we, you know, we've mentioned these five games here that sort of really epitomize what, was, what we were hoping to get out of this generation of games, this is, you know, from here, we're only going to get more and more. So uh, more and more games that really feel at home, like they're taking full advantage of the power of these current-gen consoles now. So exciting times ahead. Ryan, I want to throw you a curveball and ask you a question that we didn't discuss in our planning meeting, but this is out of, uh, because of some news that we found out today. Starfield. Best-selling game of September, and now the seventh best-selling game of the year. First of all, how long has Microsoft and Xbox waited for that to have a top-selling first-party game? And they did it in spite of the fact that Starfield was available day one in Game Pass. Yeah, we talked about this on Unlocked, which, as we record today, we just shot about two hours ago, and this was it. it this is a big deal. I mean, it's notable because yeah. you know, as you said, Game Pass is. I mean, you've got what 25 million subscribers, give or take on Game Pass, and all of those people don't have to technically purchase Starfield. You've, you're right. getting it available to you as part of your monthly subscription. So for Starfield to not only make the top 10, uh, but to be number one ahead of Mortal Kombat 1, a <laughs> yeah. game that is an absolute sales juggernaut itself, the last couple Mortal Kombats, uh, and this one in particular was a huge launch. It's a great game. It's on all the platforms, which Starfield very much isn't. So uh, for, for it to top Mortal Kombat 1 is now, and I know Mortal Kombat 1 did come out later in the month and Starfield had most of the month, but I think again, the, the platform disparity there at least cancels yeah. that, that uh, comparison piece of it out. So yeah, it's, it's really a testament to the hunger that's been out there for a new Bethesda Game Studios RPG because it had been eight years since the last Todd Howard directed RPG, which was Fallout 4. Uh, and this is a new IP from Todd and from that team that Microsoft did a, clearly they did a pretty good job of marketing it uh, and making gamers aware of it and getting people excited for it. And it's a, it's a good game. I mean, everybody's had uh, their own sort of unique experience with it, as tends mm -hmm. to happen mm -hmm. with the Bethesda Game Studios RPGs. And, and I expect it's going to have a long tail, not just because the sheer size and scope of the game is so massive, as, again, with all of uh, Todd and Team's games, but because the Xbox ecosystem is going to continue to grow. But with the Series S, Series X, this, this two-pronged strategy has worked for them. Some gamers will come in via PC as Microsoft has, mm. has grown their first party portfolio by so much. There are gonna be PlayStation gamers that, that pick up either, either a Series S or a Series X, or maybe they, they go ahead and decide to do a gaming PC. And like, there are just gonna be more people that come into the ecosystem. And when they do, Starfield is gonna be right there for them on Game Pass. Maybe they decide to, to buy it for the you know, some of the, the extras or the DLC packs, the expansions, et cetera. So I, I'm not sure. I mean, I can't imagine Starfield will be number one in October. <laughs> There's a lot of more competition, but it wouldn't surprise me if it hung around uh, on the NPD top 10 charts mm -hmm. for quite a while. And then the PC, yeah. the PC shelf life is only going to get longer with the, the help of modders. Exactly. I mean, we've already seen people mm -hmm. modding in Grand Theft Auto people. We've Thomas seen, the Tank Engine. I was going to say Thomas the Tank <laughs> Engine. Like, he's always a favorite. I, I really don't understand the fascination 100%, but I love that modders do it every game. Like, please, keep continue putting Thomas the Tank Engine in everything. Um, but yeah, no, Starfield's great. And yeah, I'm, I'm really excited it's doing well. I can't imagine that the, uh, the early access period definitely helped with that because I know it oh, sold a ton sure. of copies That's it. during yeah. that because yeah. a lot of people. So I I actually expect Microsoft to kind of follow up on that strategy with their next big 
triple A experiences. Right. Like it, they, it's a proven model, yep. and fans are willing to dish out the extra money, even though they don't have to, to be able to play it early and start having those, start building their stories in those games. So yeah, this I think this is the model for Xbox going forward. Um, okay, we have the results of the episode from last poll. We were talking about the PS5 Slim, and we asked everyone, you know, what would what would get you to rebuy a console you already own? The overwhelming majority of responses said, eh, I don't need to buy another console I already own. Of course, PS5 is the PS5 Slim model is slimmer. That's really the only difference. You're not getting any sort of power benefit there. What's interesting to me is that only 2% said a smaller size uh, would convince them to buy a console when that's really the only selling point of the PS5 Slim. <laughs> yeah. So that was amusing to me. Uh, new poll for, to vote on for next episode. Of the five games we discussed here, which is the most next-gen to you? Spider-Man 2, Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart, Cyberpunk 2077 Phantom Liberty slash 2.0, Forza Motorsport, or Microsoft Flight Simulator. Make sure to vote at IGN.com the day this episode goes live, and we'll share the results with you next episode. And that's going to do it for this edition of Next Gen Console Watch. Thank you to both Jada and Ryan. Thank you to everyone working behind the scenes in our LA and San Francisco studios to make this possible. My name is Damon. We'll be back next week with more PlayStation 5, Xbox Series X, and Next Gen Gaming News. We'll see you then.